Good morning. Isn't his name wonderful? Amen. So thankful for that. As Jimmy was leading us this morning in our to close our Sunday school and glorify thy name, I couldn't help but think of John 12. And Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, Glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What a beautiful promise. He was lifted up. He was lifted up on the Calvary. That was to signify his, his, uh, the way that he would die. But I also believe that it's our responsibility to lift him up in the place of praise. And I do believe that men and women and children are drawn to the Father and drawn to Christ when we praise him. So let's stand together. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Let's invite him to come. Father, thank you for sending your son. His name truly is wonderful this morning. And by it, we are freed from the chains that bound us, the chains of sin. And this morning, we come boldly before the throne, not with arrogancy, not because we deserve it, but because we have been invited as children. And so we come. We come hungry. We come seeking. And we come with confidence because we know that you hear the cry of your children. So this morning we ask that you would come, that you would minister to the hearts that are uh, gathered here and those that are watching online. Father, we pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would be made manifest in this place. And may we leave knowing that we have encountered the great I Am. We ask these things in your precious, perfect name. Amen. Amen. Brother Rocky's coming to lead us in the singing. Let's sing as unto the Lord. Okay, you have a should see a new songbook in the pews there. Uh, maybe referred, referred to as a chorus book, I guess. Grab that and turn to page number 40. Page 40. <clears throat>
RCC. Uh, this time, you, you can be seated. At this time, let's take up our Sunday morning expense offering. Turn to page 599 in the hymnal, the regular hymnal. <clears throat> Dean, if he'd pray for the offering,
Thank you, Rocky. Thank you, orchestra, so much for playing for us. Amen. I'm thankful that we can walk closer to him, that there is always a place beside him. Sometimes when the kids were little, they'd like to weasel their way in between their mama and me. And uh, that's all right. That's all right. But I'm thankful that when it comes to my relationship with the Lord, that there does not need to be anything between my soul and the Savior. Amen. So thankful for that. As we go to the place of prayer, uh, we continue to pray uh, for the needs that are on our prayer list. Um, we need to continue to lift up these. Um, we think of... Uh, Laura and Sister Joy, Brenda Hannah continues to need our prayers, so many physical needs. Timothy Short dealing with cancer. It, and uh, let's continue to remember Judy in prayer. She's, she's a fighting. She's a trooper. But also she's tired. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what that kind of tired is, uh, but the Lord does. And uh, let's continue to hold her up. Let's uh, continue to remember... Uh, Ruth Jones in prayer. She um, has a little bit of a journey ahead of her. And so let's pray for her as she recovers. And then um, we're praying for uh, Carl Brown's, uh, thinking especially of her daughter who had um, skull surgery on, I believe it was Wednesday. The surgery went well. Um, and uh, they were able to take their daughter home. I think her name is Alora. Anyhow, Last night, they ended up back in the emergency room. There was fluid underneath the incision. Um, uh, but as I understand it, as they were there and people were praying, the Lord just kind of settled in, and um, they were going to keep her overnight, but they decided that things were improving such that they could take her home. And so we're thankful uh, so much for that. But um, there is a long road ahead for this little girl, let's remember, uh, this family, Lorinda has co-workers that's dealing with cancer, another co-worker who has a sister that's dealing with with serious cancer. Let's remember these two co-workers. We have my co-worker who's been having surgery on Thursday. Mm-hmm. And she had a cancer surgery and she's doing okay. Yes. Um, but All right, let's remember this uh, uh, sister of a co-worker, um, thankful, so thankful that cancer had not spread to the lymph nodes. That's that's a wonderful answer to prayer, and uh, we thank the Lord for that. Let's continue. Remember Sister Peggy in prayer. Lord would touch her and help her. And of course, uh, we don't want to forget our missionaries. Let's not forget our uh, teachers and students. Um, let's also remember our college students that are away. Um, I know many will be traveling to IHC this week, and. So I think some have already begun that track, but let's remember these that are traveling, um, and let's let's remember the IHC. Even if we are not able to attend, hopefully you'll be able to at least online or uh, at least get some of it perhaps, um, but encourage you to avail yourself to that uh, if possible. But um, let's, let's lift up these things. Let's lift up our children's church. They will be presenting tonight. And uh, Jimmy is so excited about that. He, he loves to be the center of attention. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they're a little bit nervous. Dennis and Jimmy are presenting for the first time. Let's pray for them as uh, they will be, doing, uh, that as they will be uh, presenting this evening. But let's also pray for our children. Let's pray for our community as well. Are there needs on your heart you'd like us to remember? Oh, all right. Let's remember this. Wes has an aunt who had a stroke Friday evening and, and uh, is not doing well and perhaps will not make it. And so let's pray about this situation. God knows. Yes, let's remember Doyle's uh, ministry and the prison ministry that he's doing. And if you haven't contacted him directly or, uh, or Sister Mahan uh, about getting on the prayer chain, I uh, encourage you to do so. Um, 
it's not like you're going to get a bunch of prayer requests. They just put your name on a chain, a paper chain, that allows the prisoners to see how many people are praying for that ministry. And so if you'd like to do that, um, you can contact them directly. You can contact Sister Mahan. Um, I'm sure that they would greatly appreciate uh, your prayers. Yes, yes, let's do that. Let's remember this individual. God knows who they are. Um, Sister Linda shared with us that she knows a man who's cirrhosis of the liver, serious situation, uh, but does not know God, doesn't even believe in God. And so let's, let's pray God's able to reach him in this time of need. All right, Linda Kelly. Mm -hmm. All right, let's remember this missionary. I don't know how many knew Sister Bonnie Cleaver. She is a longtime missionary. Uh, she passed away this week. And so um, I know that there's going to be a void where she once stood. And so let's remember those that are grieving the loss of Sister Bonnie Cleaver. Yes. There is a 17-month-old right, baby that is rare disease, paralyzed from the chest down. Oh, okay. So, so Kristen's the mother of this 17-month-old. All right. Uh, Lord knows all about this precious little one. And we're reminded again that we live in a fallen world. It's broken. It's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm thankful that the Lord is on the throne this morning. Other needs? Mm -hmm. She came to my mind this week, too. I reached out to her. I don't remember which day it was. It seems like it was this weekend. But let's remember Sarah Lewis in prayer. Any other needs this morning? All right. We took some time for some prayer requests, and there's many, and we, you probably won't remember them all, but together we will. And so let's, each one as can, let's kneel before the Lord and let's lift up a good volume of prayer, bringing these petitions to him.
just quickly uh, announcements um, on the this evening the children will be presenting to us and so I encourage you to uh, attend and be a part of that and then it wouldn't hurt if you started praying for Sister Morford who's been working the last several weeks to prepare for her uh, her time of working with the children and so let's uh, let's come tonight uh, bringing smiles and, and encouragement and then the 21st we'll be taking up a special offering for the new course books uh, that we've received um, this will be taken in the morning service so um, I hope that you've had a chance to peruse it if you haven't I encourage you to I'm excited Alex came Wednesday night uh, with several uh, out of the course book and I uh, appreciate brother Rocky pulled one out of the course book uh, this morning and um, it may take some getting used to uh, but there's some there's some good ones in there so um, we'd like to see some of the cost of that defrayed let me just say that I have been thrilled as I keep seeing um, your giving towards our indebtedness for the remodel. Uh, just, I'm just so excited about what, uh, how you have taken on uh, that cause, and I continue every month. I'm just am amazed by your giving towards that. And um, I know that inflation is up, and groceries are up, and gas is up, and everything is up. Uh, except for probably your income. Your income's probably not going up. Um, but thank you so much for your sacrificial giving. Uh, I want you to know that it is so very much appreciated. Um, the 28th of April, we plan to have a time of fellowship. Um, we've not had that since January, so uh, uh, had a fellowship evening, so we're looking forward to that. I did... Uh, Leave a brief note on the back of the bulletin, uh, our appreciation so very much for all that you did to help revival uh, go forward this time. I believe this was one of the better revivals in the time that we've had as far as just presence of the Lord. Maybe we didn't see the victories around the altar that we'd like, um, but I do know there were victories uh, that were made in your hearts, and uh, that's, that is important too, that, and so I'm thankful for that. And I would just encourage us, let's continue to move forward as a church. Let's not, uh, let's not go back into the same routine and ruts we were in before revival. Let's keep the progress we've made and let's continue to move forward uh, for him. All right. At this time, I believe that skinks have the special uh, number and music. And so we will open our hearts and receive that ministry. song that we sang was the one that we were going to sing, oh, yeah. what we did for New Chorus. And um, I thought, well, we can just sing something else. And Bonnie was saying, sing it, sing it, sing it again. And so as I was praying, I, I was like, Lord, this is a little bit unusual. The song's already been sung. And he just came to me, and, he, and it was like he just said, I knew that we were going to sing that song when you all were practicing this song, so maybe we need to hear it again. I don't know. You're going to hear it again. Um, but I've been reading in my devotions about, it's in Leviticus, and it's a challenge to get through. Um, so many laws and traditions and customs, and um, I was thinking about the mercy seat because this song talks about that. And, you know, the mercy seat was very sacred. It was in a place by itself. It was only able to be accessed one time a year, and that was by one person. And when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that the veil in the temple was ripped from Praise the top the to the bottom, and it gave us complete access to the mercy seat. Praise and we can go to God any time we want to. We don't have to you know, put blood on the ear of a priest and on their big toe and sprinkle blood around and kill animals and all those kind of things. And I'm sure that there was a place and time for that back in those days, but I'm so thankful that Jesus made it possible that we could just go to him. He's our comfort when we need, when we need help. He's our strength when we're weak. He's our peace when we're afraid. And he just is everything that we need if we'll just go to him. So... Here we go again. Listen to the words. I think it must be for a purpose. I don't know why, but pray for 
it was for you. And so I'm going to ask if they would just sing one more verse, whichever one they feel led to, to sing. But I want you to know that if you need the mercy seat, the altar's open, that whatever you have need of, I want you to know this, that God is here this morning. And he's here on purpose for you. Maybe perhaps as Lisa had said, the bottom has fallen out in your life. Maybe there's something going on and you just need the support of your church family. Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you need sanctification. I don't know what you need this morning, but I believe the Holy Spirit has come and he's here. 
And so, brother and sister Skank, would you please sing one more verse? so much for that beautiful song and for your obedience. I know, not from singing specials, but sometimes the Lord's led me to speak on things that a lot of times it seems like in our, adult, in our class we, we talk about it and I'm going to be preaching on it. And we don't want to work anything up and I don't, I don't believe in working things up, but I do believe that God does things on purpose. And uh, we... Um, and I want you to know that if, if that song was for you, you didn't have to come to the altar. It doesn't mean that you're backslidden or anything like that. But we just want to make sure that you know that really the altar is always open at our church. We, we never close it. Um, if you have a need, we want you to come. Yes. The Ark of the Covenant and it was a square and at the top of it was uh, a gold-plated mm-hmm. cover and that was the mercy seat. But what was in the mercy seat was the Ten Commandments, the chief stone of the Ten Commandments, the mm-hmm. rod of Aaron and a, pot, a golden pot of man. Mm-hmm. Right. And the man that represented God's uh, rebellion against God's provision. Mm-hmm. And these was very, very concerning God, and he put them in, had them put in the mercy seat, I mean, mm-hmm. in the ark, and covered it with a gold plated cover. Mm-hmm. And the blood was spread over this mercy seat to cover the sins of the people. Yes. And you know, he put our sin in the mercy seat. That's right. And the blood covers our sins. Praise the Lord. When we come to the Lord and and trust the Lord, trust his blood to cover our mercy, cover us, our sins are in the mercy seat. And do you know what? God doesn't want anyone looking at our sins. If anybody opened that mercy seat, Open the lid to that mercy seat and look in, they would be struck dead. Mm-hmm. God so forgives our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ, and we accept him as our Savior, so forgives our sins, every sin we ever commit. Mm-hmm. If we trust Jesus as our Savior, they're in the mercy.
mercy seat. That's right. And you know, we're not to bring up the sin to somebody else. We're not bringing up our sin. If we open that and look at the sin, we die. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, we, we, we will Mm -hmm. And Jesus is our sacrifice. Yes. He died for our sin. What a horrible thing. After going through all that and paid the debt for our sin, what a horrible thing when he uh, presents to us, when God presents to us a gift of salvation and we turn it down. Mm -hmm. And we don't accept Jesus Christ as our only Savior, not mm -hmm. our works or anything else, but Jesus Christ. I just thought my Mm. They don't want to take this old-fashioned way. There's too many hoops, as Brother uh, once said. There's too many hoops to have to jump through, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know what this old-fashioned way consists of? He has shown the old man what the God requires of thee. Mm -hmm. But to do justly, to love mercy, yes. and to walk humbly with thy God. That is all that God requires of right. anybody. an excellent message, Brother Bob. It was a good sermon. I don't think I can preach that short. <laughs> it's a good message, Brother Bob. And it's so true. We need, to, we need to make sure that we are careful not to open and look in at the sins of others, but even to ourselves. Sometimes, I know the enemy, will, the enemy loves to open up and, and try to show us all the things we ever did, but those things are covered by the blood. And what the Lord has covered, may we never uncover. Anyone else need to mind the Lord this morning? Whether it's in testimony, whatever the case may be, we 
We don't want to hurry. One of the things that preachers have to be good at is transitioning. If, and I'm not completely sure how to transition the message this morning, even though what what we have aligns with what has been shared, and yet it feels it feels somewhat different. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five. We have. We are still using Matthew 6.33 as our, as our text. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, for all these things shall be added unto you. We have finally, just before revival, finished the first point of the first sermon of the year. Um, kind, of, kind of discouraging. And as we began to un, uh, undertake Looking at the second thought, the first, of course, was how? What are the practical steps? How do we put God's kingdom first? Um, I don't like to be told to do something I don't know how to do without instructions. But in Matthew chapter 5 and verse, verses 14 and 15, we are looking at at this next point. It's not we're no longer looking at at how to. We know how. I hope by now. I hope we do. Um, and if you've taken notes or if you want to go back into the archives and review those messages, I would encourage you to do so. But Jesus again is preaching, and we're focusing in. I do believe the Sermon on the Mount really is the the the. Um, the entirety of this, the, the theme is putting God's kingdom first. But we see it, um, we see in God's word, I'm not sure what happened. It's Matthew 6, I'm sorry, Matthew 6, I wrote it down wrong, Matthew 6, verse 14. I I don't know if you preachers have ever done that, but I have done it more times than I care to admit. Matthew 6 and verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Father, we have sensed your presence this morning, and we ask that you'd help us to continue in your presence, that we would not for a moment, step outside of the voice of the Holy Spirit, but what we would say would be a help and a blessing to each one. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Throughout history, there has been a desire and a longing, a gift, a blessing that God would love to give to us, but and one that we have wanted and yet we have found to be elusive. And that is the gift of peace. People want peace. The world shouts peace. In fact, we find even in our day this great struggle of how so many want peace in the Middle East and between Israel and, and Gaza and, and how this has become a contentious and and we are inundated, and it seems like every day the news reports how many have died in this struggle for peace. And, you know, it's amazing to me that in our humanity that we think the only way to get by killing other people, by killing the people that, that are against peace, the people that disrupt peace, and if you were to perhaps go over to Israel and, and you would go to Gaza and you would ask a person on the street if you uh, felt so courageous to be able to do so and you would stick a microphone under, uh, under the mouth of an individual and you would say to them, uh, we are asking individuals, what does it take for there to be peace? And they will say that the other side would change. 
if the other side would change, whether they were Palestinians or whether they were, were Israelites, whatever, whatever the case may be, no matter who you would ask, they would tell you it's the other side that needs to make changes. We look at the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, and, and there, what do we find is this same debate, the same thing. You ask a, a Russian, what do we need for peace? Ukraine needs to stop uh, doing what they're doing. And there, there's land that, that where uh, Russian people have been under the yoke of, uh, and mistreatment of, of the Ukrainian government. And we're here to liberate them. We're not here to do anything but liberate people with Russian uh, identity. And you ask the Ukrainians, you say, you would ask them, what, what would it take for peace? Well, Russia needs to leave our lands. They are the ones that, that have crossed over. They're the ones that have attacked. They're the ones that, that have done wrong. And isn't it amazing that this is always the human solution is to kill the other side. The only way that there would be peace on earth without the intervention of God is for everyone to be killed except for one person. And I don't even know if they would even be able to experience peace. We just crave and long for peace. I asked, I asked uh, Google to tell me how, how much of human history have we not had any wars? What, how long have we been at peace in our, in our human history? And, and the answer that, that it shot out was in the last 3,400 years, only about 8%. In that time, has the world not been at war? Peace, we long for it. Peace, we cry for it, we scream for it, we chant for it, we march for it. And those that are old enough remember the hippie movement that was all about peace, supposedly. Peace has been a huge part of the human longing. I believe that the reason for that is because God created us to live in a world of perfect peace and harmony. Adam and Eve had no disagreements before the fall. Some of you all can't even say you've been today without a disagreement with your spouse. <laughs> And that's all right. You can be saved and sanctified and have a disagreement with your spouse even on Sunday morning. You know, in fact, I, I have found that the most likely time for a disagreement with my spouse is on a Sunday morning. I don't know what it is, but it seems like Sunday morning is the time that, that just, it's, and I do believe it's the enemy. He wants to disturb our peace. He wants to disturb our, our spirit. And, and there have been times in the past where, where there's been such a disturbance of my peace that, uh, in the morning, on a Sunday morning, uh, that I've gone to the pulpit and saying, Lord, how in the world can I preach? I'm just still really upset about this morning. I still have feel turmoil in my heart. Now, I'm not this morning, okay? But it has happened. And I think probably you all can say that too. The, the morning rush to get to church on time. And perhaps you've even given up on the attempt to make it on time because that Sunday morning is of so much, it just seems like so much chaos. The enemy fighting against us in our homes. Peace, let the world cry. Peace, peace. As we enter into this new, uh, I don't know, perspective on Jesus' call to us to, and really, and I think it's more than just a call, I believe it's an invitation to put God's kingdom first. He doesn't just, he doesn't just say, here, do it. He doesn't just say, hey, you put God's kingdom first or else. 
And I, I really feel like sometimes uh, that that's kind of been the way that, that so much of Scripture has kind of been presented, and preachers have kind of uh, almost used the Bible to, to beat it over people's heads and, and said, you got to do what God says or else, and, and give them a good whap upside the head. Um, figuratively speaking, although I've seen preachers at an altar pr- whack some people pretty hard in the head while they're praying with them. Like, ease up on the person. They're trying to pray. They don't need a headache. But one of the things that so amazes me about our loving Lord is that he doesn't just bring commands, but he brings rich gifts to his children. It isn't just do it or get the belt, but it's do it and receive the reward. Re- do it and receive the blessing. Do it and find the goodness of God. One of the things that my children remember is on the many one of the many occasions that they were stuck with, you, you know, when you have a, a dad who's a, a pastor, uh, the kids also have, they're employed. They don't get paid, but they're employed. And uh, they had to endure a very long viewing. The pastor had to be there early for the family viewing, stay for that whole time. We had to stay for the whole entirety of the the rest of the viewing where, where the guests and so forth. We had We had been there. I don't know, maybe three hours, four hours. I don't know. We were there a long time. And when you have little ones, that's endurance. My kids were were gold that night. They were absolutely gold. Other kids who came in and were only there for just a short time, they were getting themselves into trouble. They were, they were carrying on, and the uh, funeral directors were getting their room and trying to get the, the chaos contained. But my children had shined that day. They really had. And on the way home, Dad made a wrong turn. I, we didn't go straight home. We made a, where we should have turned left, I turned right, and we found ourselves at the ice cream. And my boys still remember that. I don't know if Eliana remembers it or not, but, but the boys remember that. Did I, had I told them that they were getting ice cream if they were good? No, I hadn't. Had I, had I threatened to beat them within an inch of their life if they weren't good? I don't think I did, but I might have. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, of course. But because they had, had been extraordinary, and they really were, that they had, they had behaved so much higher than their age, and they had represented me well, they had represented our church well, I was convinced that there needed to be a reward. Parents, I'll just interject here. Sometimes we can focus a whole lot on the discipline and forget that the rewards are part of God's parenting of us too. And I have been just as guilty. I'm just telling you the one time I got it right, okay? Not telling you all the hundred times I got it wrong. God speaks to us and he says, child, put my kingdom first. But it's not just a command with a threat. It's a command with many rich blessings. And the first is peace. Peace with God and peace with each other. Sin is a terrible thing. I don't know that you and I could really understand how terrible sin is. I I don't think there's a... In fact, I don't know that it would be possible 
for me to exaggerate how terrible sin is. I don't know if there are words in the human language that, are so, that would somehow, some way encapsulate how awful sin is. And yet it's so easy. Jesus says he's teaching uh, 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 this same message, this same Sermon on the Mount. He tells us, he says, you've heard don't kill. But I say to you that if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart already. Well, wait a minute. I mean, it's, it's easy for me not to kill somebody. I can, I can obey that thou shalt not kill, Brother Rocky. That's, that's pretty easy. I've never murdered anyone in my life. I've, I've got that thou shalt not kill part. But hate somebody? I've hated. I've hated with a burning hatred. Jesus tells us it's more than just what we do. It's our attitudes and it's the thoughts that we entertain. Not the thoughts that jump through our heads, but the thoughts that we allow to build a home in our mind. Not the thoughts that, that are fleeting, not the thoughts that come over and over and over and we keep rejecting over and over and over. I'm talking about the thoughts that we say, come on in. Come and sit down at the table and let's have a meal together. Those things, those thoughts, are when it can cross over from something that is that we are rejecting to something that now begins to poison our soul. Sin is easy. But sin destroys our peace with God. So Jesus tells us, he goes on in the, this wonderful Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us that, listen, if you've got a sin problem, here's what I want you to do. If, if your eye offends thee, take it and rip it out of your eye socket. If your hand offends thee, go ahead and just cut it off. Now, if that were the case, everyone here would be blind and have no hands. Because your eyes have offended you. You have looked at things that you knew you ought not to look at. You have touched things you knew you shouldn't touch. You have, with your hands, have done things that you knew were wrong. If we took Jesus' words literally, we would all be without hands and without eyes. We would be blind. Does Jesus mean for us to literally go out and do those things? Not at all. Not at all. What is he telling us to do? He's telling us that we are going to have to take drastic action in order to have peace with God. We're going, to, we're going to have to take drastic measures. We can't view sin as a kitty cat that we just that's a little temperamental, that might scratch us sometimes, might bite us sometimes, but it's just a cat. No, no, no. It's not something we pet. It's not something we coddle. It's something that we have to destroy in our lives. And here's the thing. Jesus is the one who did the drastic measure. He took the drastic measures for our peace with God. He allowed his hands to be pierced. He allowed the crown of thorns to be placed on his head and the sweat and the blood to sting and, and blind his eyes. He was the one who, who allowed that his feet would be pierced with the nails so that, that he would be able to allow us to not have to cut off our feet. He allowed his heart to be pierced so that our heart wouldn't have to be pierced. Because peace with God was that 
important to Jesus. And so we we go to God and we go to the mercy seat that that was beautifully sung by both you and the skanks for us this morning. And we take our sin and we we put it on the mercy seat and the blood of Jesus is poured over those sins and we are forgiven and, and we leave there, but we still have a problem. We still have a, 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 a traitor inside of us. A traitor that continuously leads us astray, who keeps pulling us in, a, in, in the wrong direction. Calls it the carnal nature. James called it double-mindedness and whatever you call it it's still something inside of us that wishes to rebel against the law of god we still don't quite have the peace that we're looking for there has to be something better than this And Jesus tells us again in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, can I enter into the kingdom of heaven? Say, what? You see, peace with God is impossible because the Pharisees have done everything humanly possible to have peace with God. Their righteousness is extraordinary. You can't have peace with God. Jesus has just disqualified you. You can't have it. You can't, your righteousness can't exceed their, their righteousness. They've, they have spent a life. In fact, most of them were rich. And, and the only way you could be that righteous is if you were rich so you could afford all the things to do to be righteous. But here's the thing. Jesus recognized and he understood that you couldn't go and be that more righteous than the Pharisees. He understood that. And so what did he do? He said, I'm going to provide a way for you to be holy. I will provide a means so that you can be righteous and that your righteousness would exceed that of the Pharisees. How is it possible? Because the righteousness of the Pharisees was a crossing T's and dotting I's, and it was about an external righteousness, but they still had that wicked nature inside of them. They still were double-minded. They were still looking for loopholes, how they might get around the law, how they could still be righteous and still do what they wanted to do. There was still something inside of every single Pharisee that said, I want to do right, but there's some things that I want to do still, and if I can find a loophole, I'll, I'll exploit it. And when the Holy Spirit cleanses us from that inbred sin, that, that nature that says, I'm going to rebel against God, we're no longer looking for loopholes to do what we want to do. We're looking for opportunities to do what the Father wants us to do. And suddenly our righteousness is exceeding that of the righteousness of the Pharisees. The Pharisees who have the external okay, but the inside they're still warring and looking for those, those loopholes. We're not looking for loopholes. You ask me why I take the conservative way. I take it because I'm not looking for a loophole and how close I can live to the world and still get to heaven. Not looking for a loophole. I'm not looking to, you know, and, and folks, I'll tell you, this, this, just, this just grieves me that it seems like no matter where a, a denomination draws the line, it seems like there are people that love to just put one foot on either side of the line. Just get as close to that line as we can get. And this is the definition of modesty. Okay, I've got one foot here and one foot on the other side. And, and they just kind of stand there. And I was like, folks, there is something that God can do in your heart that will take that desire and that longing to straddle the line out. You say, preacher, are you saying you should go way, 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 way over here? I, no, I'm saying I just want to be where Jesus wants me to be. teaching at a Bible college 
and they were having a problem with the girls wearing dresses way, way, way too long, such that they were stepping on them. They were just, they were dragging on the ground. And they decided that this was such a problem that they were going to make a rule, and they had a minimum uh, uh, or maybe a maximum length that you had to, you had to, you could only have them so, so long. They had to be so many inches off the ground. I shook my head. You can't legislate righteousness. But here was the problem. Where they set the bar was higher than what my wife and I had felt like God had set the bar for us. We didn't feel comfortable with it being that high. And I went and I talked to the academic dean, uh, and I said to him, I said, I'm not comfortable with this rule. I said, as a, as a professor here, as a, though I'm teaching here, I said, I don't feel like we can abide by this. God set uh, the standard here in our home. I'm not saying anybody else has to have it that long. I, 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 I'm, this, is, this is where God set it for us. And my wife's skirts don't go up and down, up and down. They just go wherever God set the line for us. I said, and I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with where you're setting the line. And he says, well, you know, my wife is going to have to mend some of her skirts and dresses. They're not, they're not, they're, some of them are a little longer too. And I said, you, you have to understand, we're not changing. This, we're not changing. This is where God wants it. And, it, and if you need us to, to, to step aside and, and no longer be here, that's fine. But we're not changing. And I'm sorry if that seems to be a bad example. It's not rebellion against the school. I have no problem with you setting whatever rules you want. But God set our our line, and we have to be consistent with where God taught us. And one of the things that I hope is uh, to convey to the young people here is that the world doesn't set our standard. God does. I'm talking about is peace with God. This is a benefit that comes with putting God's kingdom first. You say, you could have lost your job. That was fine. You could have lost your influence. That was fine. You could have lost your uh, uh, ability to make changes in the school that, that needed to be. That was fine. It was all on the altar. God said this is what he wanted, his kingdom first. And whatever happens, that was up to the Lord. Oh, folks, that we would get to a place where we would be so in love with Jesus and so desiring of being at peace with God that we wouldn't care what anybody's rules book said, that we wouldn't care what anybody's uh, uh, fashion sense said. We wouldn't care about anything but pleasing the Lord and having perfect peace with him. Why are you straddling the line? I don't know. I'm not judging your heart. I I have no business to judge your heart. But I'll ask you this. Is it costing you your peace? If it is, it's not worth it. I'm not talking just about lengths of of skirts and and lengths of sleeves and lengths of hair and lengths of whatever or other. I'm talking about wherever it seems like that people draw lines and, and, and denominations and our rule books and all things it just always seems like you find these people that just are never satisfied they want to get just as close as they can you know what happens if you get too close to the line on 160 you're going to find yourself somewhere where you don't want to be Folks, we have an enemy that is trying to drag us into the spiritual ditch. Why would you play too close to the line? Now, again, I don't say go the other way. Don't, get, don't go crossing the yellow line. That can be just as dangerous or maybe even more dangerous. I'm not suggesting that, that, that we should be at extremes. I'm talking about well, can we put ourselves right in, the, in, in a place, we, and I where we are just saying, Lord, I, all I want to do is, is I want to keep it between the lines. I just want to keep where you're happy and where I'm at peace. 
You say, well, pastor, are you saying that I got to line up to you? Absolutely not. I'm saying the exact opposite of that this morning. Well, now it's this afternoon. I'll try to hurry. Remember, I got a late start. I'm saying align yourself with the Lord. Align yourself with the Holy Spirit and what he says to you. It's not about what I have to say. I'm not important. And it's not about what the denomination has to say. And, and, I, and, and I appreciate our book. And, and when you become a member, you say that you're going to try to live by that. And I, and I do believe we ought to keep the promises that we make. If you're a member this morning, you, you, need, to, you need to follow what you've, what you've said that you're going to do. But what I'm most interested in is that you would find peace with God because you've allowed him to be your North Star. Not me, not the denomination, but the Lord. You see, when we put God's kingdom first, not your own kingdom and not the not the not a denomination's kingdom, not, not, not the world's kingdom, but, but when we put God's kingdom first, the, the rich blessing that he brings is peace with the Father. But is he content to leave it there? No, 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 no. For whatever reason, God has seems to place on the same level peace with our fellow man as he does Peace with God. It doesn't make sense to me. I would, I, in fact, I really, if you just want my, my own logic and my own thinking, peace with God is the most important thing. And peace with other people, that's, that's a nice secondary thing. It's not important. But God says, if you will not forgive those that have sinned against you, then I'm not going to forgive you. If you don't want peace with others, then you won't have peace with me. Now that sounds strange. Now that probably doesn't sound strange to you because you maybe you've heard this all your life and, and you've just kind of accepted it, accepted it. But really, this, this afternoon I ask you the question, does that make sense? Doesn't it make more sense that God would be interested in our relationship with him and, and people just don't matter? No. Because God wants your neighbor to have peace with him. And if I don't have peace with, with my neighbor, but I say I have peace with God, well, how is, he, how is my neighbor ever going to find peace with God? The world, the world is littered with people who no longer go to church and who no longer serve God because somebody in the church hurt them. Sometimes, sometimes the church person really did hurt them. And other times, the person who was out there and feeling hurt it was their own choices that they made that led to that. But here's what I know. Jesus teaches us in this great sermon, we've got to have peace with each other in order to have peace with God. What does that mean? That means that I as we've already preached about, we're going to have to go and leave our altar at the gift and deal with those that have ought against us. It means confronting some things, and we may need to bring someone with us, especially if we're a more timid individual. We may need to, to say, this, this is causing a problem in my prayer life. It's causing a problem in my peace because there's something between us. I have a hard time worshiping with you. Because when I worship with you, I think about what you did. Or maybe it's you think about what you did. I 
You see, when we put God's kingdom first instead of our own kingdom and our own happiness and our own uh, 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 well-being, we, we put God's kingdom first and we, we start to, to make peace with others, what happens? We find that the gift of peace comes because we put God's kingdom first. Is this easy? No, this is really hard. It's a whole lot easier for me to go to God and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. That is a whole lot easier than going to Sister Linda and say, Linda, I'm sorry. I, am, I, I really should not have said that. I embarrassed you and I shouldn't have done that. That is a whole lot harder for me to do than to go to the Lord and tell him I'm sorry. Do you know why? Because I know what the Lord's going to do. He's going to forgive me. But I don't know if Linda's going to forgive me. She might, she might not forgive me at all. She might hold it over my head for as long as she lives. I hope not. I don't think she will. But you know, I've had people who have professed to be saved and sanctified who have done just that. Where... In fact, I'm thinking of one lady right now. She thought I did something. I, I, and she was told repeatedly that I didn't do what she believed that I did. She had people who were in the know. There were several people in the church that kept going to her and saying, Sister, Jeremy didn't do it. But she was so convinced. I don't know where she got the idea that I'd done something. But she was so convinced that she would not shake my hand for anything. I would go to her and try to shake her hand, and she would pull away from me. She didn't have peace with me. Now, folks, I'll tell you, I had peace with her. I had perfect peace with her. I had nothing against her. If she wanted to think what she thought about me, so be it. That was fine. She could think it. I was at perfect peace with her. It didn't change my relationship with her. It didn't change the way I thought about her, except for that I was sorry that she felt the way she did. I, I felt sorry for the burden. But she lost her peace over something that didn't even happen. I need to let you go. The, I know some of you like to be out by noon, but I just I didn't only preach 35 minutes this morning. But peace with God and peace with our fellow brothers and sisters is possible when we put God's kingdom first. It's not possible until we do that, though. And God is offering rich, rich blessings if we'll just put his kingdom first. Let's stand together. Thank you for your kind attention. I know especially the little ones were, were done with me preaching. And I tell you what, I'm looking forward to Sunday dinner. Father, thank you for peace. Not as the world gives it. The world's peace is temporary. The world's peace is, always comes with strings attached. But your peace is perfect peace. That passes all understanding. And when the life's battles and storms and struggles come, we find that your peace remains in our hearts. Father, I ask that you would help us to be a people that are known for the blessing of peace. That we offer peace to those that are around us. We offer forgiveness. We offer mercy. We offer our own apologies when we make mistakes or when we hurt people inadvertently. Father, I ask that you would help us to be a church that puts your kingdom first in all things. Help us to, this afternoon as we uh, rest. Lord, strengthen us for the evening and may you be glorified and all that's said and done in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Don't forget that one. The boys are in there. Got that one.